Hey, Creek, how we doing? Let's go. Let's go. I'm not getting pinched. Not getting pinched. So I, I asked my mother-in-law if I should wear this. She said, yeah, that would be funny. She was right. I don't know how, to, I, don't know how I feel about that. Hey, I want you guys to help me think of a, a movie. Uh, this is like the, the perfect opener for today. And so it's a movie where there's a team and the team's trying to accomplish something and there's people not on the team. And, and, and they're, they're like the opposition, the enemy. And then at some point in the plot, they get added to the team. And, and at first there's adversity, but when they figure out how to work together, they go on to do great things. What movie is that? What'd you say? Remember the Titans is, a, is, what is it? Mighty Ducks. Mighty Ducks, is that what you said? That was your contribution? It, it, it is in the Mighty Ducks, what? The Sandlot, the Sandlot. you guys are good at this game, man. Feels like plants. Uh, any, any others? Miracle? Coast Guard, is that what it's called? Coast Guard, that's the name of the movie? Any others? Air Bud. <laughs> uh, the Kingdom. Is that a movie? Oh, like The Kingdom? Sure. There's always somebody that ruins the illustration for everybody. Yeah. So it, it really has, it's been played out in a lot of movies. A lot of movies. I mean, that, that is the scene. I mean, remember the Titans is a really clear one because there's this like uh, racial tension. They're on the outside, they get blended in. At first, they don't know how to work together. They, they figure out how to, they, they go on to do it. I mean, anything from the movie Armageddon to Ocean's Eleven. I mean, it's a plot where you're building this team to accomplish a goal and at first there's adversity. Hey, we don't know how to work together. I don't even know if I like you. But, but once we figure out how to work together through our differences, we go on to do great things. And my, my friend in the front row is absolutely right. That is the plot that we're living in more ways than one. And that's where we're gonna be in the scripture today in Ephesians chapter two, verses 11 through 22. So as a reminder, we're, in, we're studying the book of Ephesians. We're kind of moving through verse by verse, section by section, chunk by chunk, to understand, okay, what is Paul saying to the church in Ephesus and surrounding churches about 62 AD? He's penning this letter. He's in prison in Rome, probably chained to a Roman soldier. He's writing this maybe through a scribe. He actually wrote lots of books at this time, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. And, and so here we are, we're, we're studying it and we're saying, all right, what is the eternal truth for us? Why did the Holy Spirit preserve this for thousands of years so that we would read it in church today and, and look at it like a mirror and say, okay, what changes do I need to make about my life after observing this text? The subject is brought in, blended, and built up. Those are the three words. The text hands me the, the alliteration today, a preacher's dream, brought in, blended, and built up. Let me ask you a question. If I choose to show a particular ethnic group a lot of favor at the expense of, of other ethnic groups around them, what am I? You, you might say racist, to which I might say, well then, is God racist? Because that's the story of the Old Testament and you've gotta reconcile that. You say, well, why would you say that? because I don't do a really good job at tiptoeing around questions that I have in the text. I don't wanna play that game. If we're looking at something that doesn't make sense, it's confusing. We should talk about it, right? And it seems like this whole Old Testament is this story of God choosing a particular ethnic group of people and blessing them at the expense of others around them. That's a big part of, of like, like more than half the Bible that you have that you read and that you, your affections are stirred. And, you know, and if we have this question, we should seek out an answer. God is blessing them to be a blessing to others. And, and at some point, and this is so important for us to understand, they took their faith 
and they made it about rules and rituals. Their heart drifted from God, and he says, okay, if you're not going to get the job done, then the message is going to go beyond you, and I'm going to begin to bless the nations myself. And that's where we come into play. If you're here and you're not of Jewish descent, you're not ethnically a Jew, then this message is extremely important to you because I've heard it said, we must learn history or we risk repeating it. And what's the story of the Old Testament? God choosing a people, blessing them abundantly, setting them free from slavery? setting them free and then them saying, wait, I wanna go back to slavery. I don't wanna follow you, I'm rebelling against you. And and even toward the New Testament, growing prideful and arrogant in their holy huddles, saying, hey, we're just gonna circle up, we're better than them, and and this, you know, we know God and we're going this way, and they dumbed their faith down to rules and rituals and we better know that. We gotta understand what does that mean for us, and the reality is we've been blended in because God is trying to accomplish something and you don't wanna drop the baton. You wanna understand, okay, what is it that he wants to do? Where do I fit into this greater narrative of what God is accomplishing? And so a preview today, is we've been brought into God's kingdom, we've been blended with the Jews, and we are being built up into God's temple. That's, that's where we'll go, how we'll break up the text. Um, as a, a, by way of review, we started just talking about the church in Ephesus kind of coming, like people are turning from black magic, they're burning their, their sorcerer scrolls, they're following Jesus and, and the church, one of the most powerful churches of antiquities is being built up, the the church in Ephesus. Paul writes this to them and the surrounding areas. And then in week one, we talked about this reality that you and I have been chosen by God to know him, to be a part of his family, to be his children. And then we looked at a prayer for the Ephesian church that we can learn from, like what, what is Paul praying for them that the Holy Spirit preserved for us to read and understand. And then last week is the gospel, straightforward. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for us to do or prepared in advance for us to walk in, that God has something that he wants to accomplish, and then, and then boom, here we are. Right there, we're his masterpiece, okay, so what? Therefore, because God prepared you for these works in advance, the things he wants to do, therefore, remember, and that word remember is going to be repeated. So this is a, don't repeat history. Remember that formerly you are the Gentiles. Now, I think for a long time I'd read the Bible It's like the Gentiles, oh yeah, kind of like I'm the Gentile, who the Gentiles, what is that? The Gentiles, that word just means the nations. So if you're here, you're Chinese background, Persian background, um, Indian background, English background, German background, Czechoslovakia, Polish, if you are anywhere other than any, any other ethnicity than Jewish, that Gentiles, that's you. That's you, like this is, this is for you and I. By birth, that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. And then parenthetically, he says something important here. He, he's trying to let you know, he says, which is done in the body by human hands. He, he's, saying, he's saying, hey, that thing, that covenant that was the mark of God's people it's something changed. It's just physical now. Do that if, if you want to for the sake of cleanliness or don't. It has no implications for faith whatsoever. And he says in 
Matthew 3, 9, he says, don't, don't say to me that you are from Abraham, for God can raise up from these stones sons of Abraham. He's saying, hey, that distinction doesn't mean anything anymore. And then verse 12 starts with that word again. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let me just start by saying, he, he's repeating the admonishment or the exhortation for us to remember, I don't think we have, okay? I don't, this isn't everybody's favorite memory verse. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and 10, probably got that on a coffee cup. This one, you're like, oh, I don't, so what is, lots of words, what does that mean? And he's like, remember, remember, hey, don't forget this. And I think we have. I, I, I think we've forgotten this. He, he says, this is who you were, okay, here, you're here, not of Jewish descent. You were separate from Jesus. You were excluded from citizenship. You were foreigners to the covenants without hope and without God, without Jesus and destined for hell. That's who you were. And this is what you need to know, that the, the Bible, the, the, the culture that Paul's writing this to is, is riddled with extreme ethnic prejudice. Today you will call racism. The Jews of this time, like they wouldn't want to go anywhere near you, eat with you, and in fact, if they went into your house, when they would leave, uh, they would dust off their shoes so as not to carry out the pagan dust. That was commonplace here. If they were going uh, to a place and there were, say, Sumerians there, they would take a, 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 like a two-day detour to avoid them. Now, if you feel I'm being anti-Semitic, no, it goes both ways. Like there's all, this is, the, this is what Paul is addressing right here, but it's certainly the prejudice goes both ways. And so this is the tension that this is being written into right here and there's a a the the net result for the jews was this like a sense of entitlement and elitism all while being oppressed by the roman government but a real sense of hey we're better than them and and you kind of see this sometimes in camps of of a really high view of God's sovereignty, which don't get me wrong, I have a high view of God's sovereignty, but in those camps, you will sometimes see this kind of look down on, make fun of, you might say bully, uh, you know, speak in a way that is inconsistent with the scriptures. You'll see preachers do it, Christians do it. It's, it's different than what the scripture calls us to. And so we were outsiders watching the Jews enjoy the promises of God and now we've been inviting in, been, been invited in and Paul is saying, don't you ever forget that. My first point is you have been brought in. Remember that you have been brought in. So a couple observations here. One, I want you to know, I'm gonna give you the answer to a test question. It's really important because I hear it all the time. Hey, how did you become a Christian? Oh, I've always been a Christian. How did you become a Christian? Man, really, ever since I was born. I hear that all the time. Way go, Texas. Churchgoers. You understand, I want, to, I want you to know, plain and simple, that is not true of anyone. No one was born a Christian. Okay? Like at some point, in your journey, you became a Christian. Now you don't, don't no anxiety here, you don't have to know the date or the time. I hear that all the time, you're like, oh, I don't know the time, it's okay. You don't need to know when. Yeah, it's great if you do. You don't have to though, to get into heaven, okay? At some point, you were, what scripture says, justified. That just means declared righteous. Now the confusing part from where we've been, what we've been learning, is that in the very beginning you were predestined and you were called, chosen by God, and then at some point, at some point, 
justified. And so that's that kind of difficulty that we have of explaining things in chronological order when God sits outside of time and he knows the end from the beginning. So there's some challenges for us getting uh, our heart around that, but what I'm, my point in saying this is no one was born a Christian. Second thing I want to bring your attention to is though, at one point in history, you couldn't have become one. It wasn't available to you. Okay, so before you can become a Christian, it had to be made available to people like you. Again, assuming, speaking to those non-Jews. And, and the Jew, Jewish is confusing because it's both a faith and an ethnicity. Now that's not true of Muslims, that's not true of Hindu, that's not true of Buddhist, that's not true of Christians. But when I use the word Jewish, that word can mean my ethnicity or it can mean my faith. And the two don't, I can be Jewish and a Christian. Like I can be ethnically Jew and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And I can be Jewish faith and not of Jewish ethnicity. So that can be a little bit confusing. And so the gospel has made available, has been made available to us. And again, it's not an anti-Jewish message. The gospel is available to Jewish people also as I just said, I, I've actually shared the gospel with a Jewish leader once. There's two, I was in a conversation with two Jewish leaders uh, high up, uh, you know, a part of that faith, uh, devout, leading others in Judaism. And, uh, and, it, and I was just like, you, you guys are still looking for the Messiah, right? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. This is what we believe. And they kind of were sharing that with me. And I said, um, hey, why did you, like, what about Jesus? Like, why wasn't he the Messiah? And this is what they said, and it's gonna surprise you. This is, this is the first guy go, t- says, and I'm telling you verbatim, these are his words. He goes, huh, I don't know, I've never considered it. And the other one chimes in and goes, yeah, I've never thought about that. Now, I think, having had that conversation a few times with Christians, I think that really surprises us, which is a little bit of our arrogance. Like, of course, everybody knows what we believe, you know? And they're like, oh, wait, hold on. So what, so what is it that you believe about Jesus? You know? And, it was, and these, are, these aren't like fresh Jewish converts. I mean, these are leaders in Judaism. And so there's a great gospel starting point for you. It's like, hey, what about Jesus? pretty much with any world religion, by the way, or atheist, or agnostic, any faith. Hey, what about Jesus? That's free. So this mystery has been made, to, made known to you. This is incredible news for us. It's that the creator of the heavens and the earth has adopted us now as his children. Like, that's my daddy. Like, he owns the whole world. Like, that's awesome. But you have to, what Paul's trying to say, I want you to remember where it started. And like the imagery that I get is the, the movie, The Sandlot, somebody said it here. Um, uh, what's his name, Smalls? What's his name? But is it like first name, Sam Smalls, Scott Smalls? Scotty Smalls, yeah, thank you, Taylor. Scotty Smalls, and, and so I just see, he's new to town and like everything revolves around the sport of baseball and he's just there with his fingers in the chain link fence looking, being left out because they're like, hey, he's the new guy. He's not gonna play. He's not one of us. He's not allowed. And so all he can do is just peer through the chain link, got his fingers in and he's just looking. And he's like, they get to have the fun. They get to play the game. I'm on the outside. And then at some point as the, as the plot progresses, you're one of us. You're invited and you can play. You're on the team. We got your back. And that's what happened. That's, we, we've been, we were outside looking in. Ah, That's weird, funny hats. They gather on Saturdays, like what is, what is it? And then at some point it's like, no, this message of salvation is available to you. Let's go. Verse 14. 
for he himself is our peace, underline it, who has, been, uh, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. There's actually a dividing wall at this time in the temple in Jerusalem. There's some disagreement on what this means. There's the Gentile courts and the Jewish courts and there's a wall in between. And so some scholars think that Paul is referring to that. I think he's speaking spiritually, like he's using that wall as an illustration or a metaphor to say, hey, there's a wall between us and that wall is being torn down because it didn't literally come down as he wrote this. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself, that's Jesus, one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, underline it, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace, underline it, to you who were far away and peace, underline it, to those who were near. For through him we, have, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. A really clear message here. Hey, remember, 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 there was a dividing wall of hostility. Hostility's mentioned twice, but he came to bring peace, to, to make the two groups one group, that they would work together to accomplish one end goal. There's something for us to do, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. What is it? Go to church. No. No, 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 no. No, tithe. No, that's not it. No, you don't you, just, just um, I don't know, like gather up and pray. No, all those things are important. They should be a part of who we are. But he's talking about building a team and accomplishing something. This is like at some point, this is the angst I feel. I always feel it right about now. It's like at some point, when did this fall out of our faith? Like when do we start reading this book and think, oh, it's, but it's different now. It's different, like he really, now he just wants us to sit for an hour and a half on Sundays. That's really what he's looking for. Dude, that's not Christianity. It never, ever has been Christianity. He's blended us. Um, I come from a blended family. Dad was married, had my sister and brother. Mom was married, had my sister. Mom and dad get married. Dad gets custody of the two of them. Mom gets custody of my sister. They get married, they have us. I heard my whole life, it's her, his, hers, and ours. It's his, hers, and ours. I'm the ours. And, um, and, and so you can imagine, right, four siblings, one bathroom, like we all grew up under the same roof, kind of Brady Bunch, if you will. And, uh, you know, we've got to figure out how to get along. Like there is a, hey, how are you, you know, moment. Where like my brothers and sisters are meeting for the first time. It's like, well, I, I, oh, so you're my, you're my new sibling or we're going to be siblings. We become siblings and we've got to figure out how to get along. And that's the picture that Paul is is writing to us, the Holy Spirit is writing to us here. Why do we gotta figure out how to get along? Because 2 Corinthians 5.18, you can write that down. It, it, it says we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. It's 2 Corinthians 5.18, it's not on the board. We've been given a ministry of reconciliation, like we're putting the pieces back together. And so my second point is you have been blended. You have been blended. Christians are not divisive. What you, the word that you see here, is, is peace. The gospel is divisive. <laughs> like like the, you, you, the, you can present the gospel to somebody and they can respond to it a, a number of ways. We, you and I, are agents of peace. What does this mean? Let me, let me show you. I naturally, I don't even know how naturally it is. Like I um, have the gift of sarcasm, okay? So like in college, like my friends, like it was like survival of the fittest and whoever could 
put the other one down or say the most cruelest, crudest thing about the other one's mom or whatever that was. Like that's who, I wasn't a believer, wasn't a Christian. That's who raised to the top. That was the, the king of the hill, if you will. And so that for a long time, like that was there, Holy Spirit comes in my life and I'm like, all right, what do I do with this gift, you know? And, um, and, and what you can do with it, and a lot of people do, is you just sit there with the Bible open and you say, this is what I believe, and then you make fun of people who don't believe it. You're like, well, they're stupid, you know? And, and you, listen, you want a fast track way to grow a platform, that's how you do it. And that, like, that mindset suits me, if you will. Like, that, that's, that comes natural. Like, I know how to do that. The problem with that is the gospel, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that, that we are now agents of peace and ministers of reconciliation, putting things back together. Here's what I've learned. People who are really good at that, they're not really good at putting things back together. They're really good at creating division and a holy huddle around them saying, this is my team, who's your team? Let's go to battle. That's not the gospel. But, but you can take this too far. Like I want you to know, it is okay for you to have a biblical conviction on things. And it's okay for you to express that biblical conviction. Like you can say, like, like what do I mean? Um, a, a man should not sleep with a man. Should not be. A woman should not become a man. Should not be. We should not terminate lives in the womb. It should not be. Now, as I say that, there's some of you so uncomfortable right now. Like, can he say that? Of course I can. The scripture does. But how I say that really matters. And who I'm saying that to, if at the end of saying it, I'm not willing to have them sit down at my table, something's gone really wrong. Like, if I can't, if I can't be with them, and love them and care for them and, 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 and my message is not attractive? You know what I mean? Like, like the, not just that message, but the totality of it where they're not looking at your life and saying, listen, I disagree with you on the baby thing, but man, I got, I got it. You're, you're clearly onto something. Your life is so marked by peace. I mean, there's just something about you that I want for myself. And, and, and I hate, I really disagree with what you said. But man, the way you said it, I, it just kind of moved my heart that way. So if you and I are followers of Jesus and we don't know how to handle the trans person handing us our coffee, right? Then, then at some point, some area of our life, we've stopped following Jesus, right? Because what you can, you can think about it. Well, what should it look like? And then this is where the whole WWJD thing is actually helpful. What would Jesus do? Would it be the finger in the chest? Hey, let me teach you something. Or would it be like, hey, tell me about your background, your story, your upbringing. Man, where does this come from? Like there's, I, I wanna get to know you. Hey, let me get another cup of coffee. What time are you off? And you say, who does that? <laughs> Good question. Followers of Jesus do that. Followers of Jesus do that. That is the, that's the normal, natural, like way that the gospel has progressed. And as it turns out, the, hey, let me give you a piece of my mind and come with a really well-crafted video and argument that's airtight and call you stupid, turns out that doesn't work very well. Like that doesn't, that, that doesn't cause anyone to win. And these are lessons I had to learn the hard way. There's no room for treating anyone with less than dignity in the gospel. The gospel is a story of you being given more than you could ever deserve. And so what you do when you have a right understanding of the gospel is you give to others more than they could ever deserve. It's called grace. And, and this is what we're called to, like we weren't saved for nothing. 
we weren't saved for nothing. We were saved for a purpose. Let me take you back to um, First Baptist Cuero, Texas. Got a little three-on-three tournament. Uh, this year in Cuero High School, I think the year was 1998. And this particular year, we had what was called the dream team in basketball. Um, there were three guys whose chemistry was just incredible. David Maldonado from the outside, I just remember he would, he would shoot the ball anywhere in the court. He would yell the word stroke and it would just swish. Any, I mean, I don't, it was like, no, look. It was like, how do you do that? He shoots the ball, ball's going in the basket every time. Guarded, unguarded, fade away from the threes, from half court, wherever it is. He shoots the ball, it's going in, it was unbelievable. But then they're the twin towers, Michael Williams and Bobby Mays. And, and they both like 6'5 or something. It wasn't like obnoxiously tall like me, but, but, but tall. And, and they were, and athletic, which is a good pairing, turns out. And they would throw the ball off the back wall and catch it in air and just like they, you know, alley-oops and David, like their chemistry, they would throw the ball up, alley-oop, backwards, forwards, 360. It was just, it was a show. It was a spectacle. And First Baptist Church is, is hosting a three-on-three tournament and the three of them are a team, but it's teams of four. And they say, Jonathan, you're on our team. And I say, why? <laughs> and they're like, hey, we just, we need a fourth, come on. And so I'm thinking, oh, you're, cause I'm not good by the way, just in case you're, if you're new here. <laughs> you're like, oh, he's tall, he must be good. No, those, that doesn't have to be true. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm not even on the team. I quit athletics by this point. They're like, hey, you're, you're our fourth. And, and so they're playing and it's a spectacle. I mean, they're like, they're throwing it off the back wall, dunking it even though it doesn't count because it was out just to show you, just to intimidate the other team, just dominating. I mean, there, it was like the tournament. I mean, other teams haven't even scored, like complete shutout, right? But, but I remember David coming up to me. He's like, hey, you're in. I'm like, no, no, I'm good, man. <laughs> I'm watching. That's amazing. Y'all keep doing your thing, man. He goes, no, 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 you're going to play. I would go, why? He goes, because you're on the team because you're on the team. And I think like some of us got to hear that this morning. You know, it's like, oh man, I love, I love these seats. You know, they're comfortable. You know, man, that's good. It's like, ah, that's a good message. Yeah, man. It's good. I love the worship today. That new song, man, that's great. Yeah. I even lift my hands off the move. You know, I, I love watching the professionals. Like some people are called to foster. That's great. Fill their empty bedrooms. Man, that's awesome. That whole trans coffee thing. I'm going to think about that. You know, that's for somebody. Somebody's going to do that. I mean, there's, oh, and there's people. And he's up there teaching. That's good. He's got that gift. You know, the teaching gift. That's not really my thing. And people in the parking lot. You know, it's awesome, man. Hey, thank you. Good to see you, Mr. Parker. You know, and it's just like, man, it's so good. And I think you just got to hear right now. You're gonna play because you're on the team. If you're not on the team, you don't know Jesus, you're here, man, hang out as long as you want. Hope you see the fragrant aroma of Christ and, and are moved to him. If you're here and you know Jesus, get in the game. It's time. If you're like, oh, but I, I will if God tells me to, you know, I'll need a sign. There's your sign. <laughs> Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. We're, we're his children. What is this? This is like a recap. You've been brought in and blended. Um, and then he says the word built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone, our foundation of faith, is Jesus Christ. In him, the whole building is joined together and, and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So where it says, um, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, it's saying the, the apostles and the prophets foundation, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ himself. And in him, 
You two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God is making his home among us. Who, who's the us? Us, who? People who are very different, who don't get along, who don't like each other, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic statuses, different ethnicities, different belief systems about investments and buying homes and buying cars and, and Bitcoin, <laughs> all kinds of things that we can disagree on. But when we agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, we better learn how to get along. Because if you can't, you gotta go back to, do I actually have the Holy Spirit? There are people in the flock and controversy follows you. Division follows you. Explosives, explosive bouts of anger follow you. Go back to it, man, do I really, am I sure? The spirit of peace, does he dwell in me? Like sometimes you should stay in a dysfunctional relationship so that you can learn, I don't mean dating relationship, I mean like friendship so that you can learn how to grow. I always say my, my single friends, they say, how do I prepare for marriage? I was like, get a dysfunctional roommate. <laughs> it's the best training. The, the soil in Woodway is, is awful. It's clay and it expands and contracts. And so you have to have a good foundation because if not, your house will crumble on it. And if you build your faith on anything other than Jesus, it's going to crumble. There are entire Instagram and TikTok accounts right now of people whose faith has crumbled because they built it on rules and rituals and people and regulations and, and other ideologies under the banner of Christianity, but it wasn't built on Jesus. He's the only foundation that's going to hold you up. And so my third and final point is you are being built up. You are being built up, built into something. God is building his home among us. Listen, Monica, I, Monica and I, my wife and I had the opportunity to build a house. One of the exciting days in building a house, the foundation is laid, okay? Get the, the post-tension slab, you got rebar and, and um, oh, what's that wire called? Cable, yeah, cables going through it, like holding it tight, because it's tough, you know, TSTC. And, uh, and so it, all kinds of stuff, holding that slab together, and then it's time to go up. And what happens, what happens is, is a truck shows up and it drops off the building supplies, bricks and sticks, okay? Two by fours and boards and, and sheetrock and, and, um, and um, plywood and then, and then bricks on pallets and pallets of bricks. And really you're looking at your house on the ground Right, and it's, it's Lego time, Lincoln Law time, right? We're gonna, we're gonna make sense of all this and begin to put it together. And, and a good builder is gonna inspect that. And there's every, you know, when you build, there's a, there's a giant trash bin there. And sometimes it's made out of, out of like fence, sometimes it's an actual trash bin. And if a brick is broken, it's thrown in the trash bin. If a board's not straight, it's, straight, it's thrown away. If there's a knot in it that makes it not usable, you know, it's, it's thrown away. We, need, we wanna build this out of good supplies. I love this idea that God then takes that trash bin of broken people and says, I'm gonna build something out of this. People with, with stories of abuse, people with stories of hurts, people with stories of habits, People with stories of, hey, I grew up in church and, and I always, I didn't do any of that and I've always wondered his life over there or I, I'm bent towards self-righteousness. I'm tempted to judge those. And God says, hey, if you will humble yourself, if you will realize your need for a builder and, and not just a desire to be alone, a, a piece of broken brick by yourself, but if you'll say, no, I wanna be, I wanna play nice with others, I wanna play well in the sandbox, I wanna learn to get along, then God says, I'll build my home out of you. And the church, that word, the first time it shows up in scripture, is the word assembly, that God is assembling something, he's putting something together out of those who will humble themselves. His building supplies, is our broken people and the foundation is, is a, a person who was broken for us, Jesus Christ. And that's a picture of the church. And we have a job to do.
He, he's building us together for a purpose. And so in summary, we have been brought into the kingdom of God by the blood of Jesus. We have been blended in with the Jews who trusted in Jesus as the Messiah. We are being built up into God's temple, an army of God's people, making a home for God to live in forever. Last night I watched a movie about a man who lived 1600 years ago. He was kidnapped at the age of 16 and taken to another country where he was forced to work as a slave. Uh, he endured physical abuse at the hands of these people and he worked there and lived there as a slave for six years. When he was a Jesus follower, God showed up to him in a dream and said, I'm gonna give you a way out by way of a boat, a ship that's tied to a dock. I want you to go find it. He wakes up, he travels 200 miles, indeed finds the ship that's going back to his home country, which is today Northwest England. You guys know who I'm talking about. St. Patrick. Patrick wasn't Irish, he was British, captured by the Irish, which was the worst nation in the known world. Incest, bestiality, abuse were all commonplace there, slavery. So he goes back to the comforts of his land. Having escaped, he's been set free when God speaks to him again and stirs his heart around the people who had left him with scars and trauma. And he says, I've gotta go back. And everybody said, you are out of your mind. He takes a boat back to Ireland. And when he gets there, they have tied him to this Druid prophecy that a crazy man is gonna come from the seas. So immediately they capture him, they chain him up, they beat him and they rob him. And he stays. And he begins to share the gospel with those people. To tell them about the love of God through his son, Jesus Christ. When he got there, Ireland was among the worst nations in the known world. When he died there in Ireland, it was the most Christian nation of the known world. Why? Because of the faithfulness, humility, love, and obedience of one single person. If you want to change the world, it's not going to be your sarcasm. It's not going to be your quick-witted put-down. It's not going to be your well-crafted reel. Okay. It is going to be your steadfast faithfulness to declare the truth and love hand in hand. And all of you, every person listening, if you are a Christian, have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. Right now, you need to ask yourself, and I'm talking to you, not you, but you. You're in the commons, I'm talking to you. What did God create me to do? What is the reconciliation that needs to take place? What parts of my calloused heart need to die? And if all of us did that, just us in the room, but just you, if just you did that, the world as we know it would never be the same. No one is too old, no one is too young. Everyone has a faithful next step. You need to determine right now what that is. I'm gonna pray that you would. Father, would you help us know what that is? Would you raise up out of this group some St. Patrick's? Would you raise up out of these saints some Patrick's and Patricia's, some faithful servants of Jesus that would declare to those that we are tempted to hate your goodness? Would you soften our hard hearts, give us a vision of hope, and help us to live as you've called us to. 
in the name of Christ.